Mic check, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five. Brandis is here. I'm live at CTU headquarters. Thank you. Thanks for joining us on this Wednesday, October 2nd. I'm Phil Ponce. And coming up on Chicago Tonight, Chicago teachers set a strike date. Is red meat not so bad for us after all? And the history behind the Art Institute Lions. But first, it was another tense day in Washington amid the impeachment inquiry into President Donald Trump's actions. Paris Schutz has the latest on that story and more of what's making news tonight. Paris. Phil, Democratic House leaders warned the White House today to cooperate with the impeachment inquiry and that any attempts not to could backfire against the president. This comes a day after U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo pushed back against Democrats' efforts to interview dim diplomats involved in Ukraine. House Intelligence Committee Chairman Adam Schiff says the Trump administration has not complied with oversight subpoenas and it could lead to further legal action. We are concerned that the White House will attempt to stonewall our investigation, much as they have stonewalled uh, other committees in the past. Um, it's why I say the White House needs to understand that any action like that, uh, that forces uh, us to litigate or have to consider litigation, uh, will be considered further evidence of obstruction of justice. And Schiff will be here in town tomorrow to speak at Northwestern University. Meanwhile, the president shot back with unfounded claims that Schiff had possibly helped write the Ukraine whistleblower report and again dismissed the entire inquiry as a hoax. Trump refused to answer a reporter's question about the controversial phone call with the Ukrainian president and the conversation about Joe Biden, which led to a heated exchange today. Sir, was what did you want President Zelensky to do about Pres Vice President Biden and his son Hunter? Are you talking to me? Yeah, you it was just a follow-up of what I just asked listen, you, sir. Listen, you ready? We have the President of Finland. Ask him a question. I have one for him. I just wanted to follow up on the one that I asked you, which did was, you hear what me? did you want? Did you hear me? Yes, sir. Ask him a question. I, I will. But I've my... given you a long answer. Ask. <laughs> this gentleman a question. Don't be rude. No, sir, I don't want to be rude. I just wanted you to have a chance to answer the question that I asked I've you. I've answered everything. It's a whole hoax. And you know who's playing into the hoax? People like you. Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan's former chief of staff, along with a former political aide, should be permanently banned from being hired by the state of Illinois again. That's the conclusion today from the state's legislative inspector general. The report finds that former aide Kevin Quinn did sexually harass former political employee Elena Hampton and that he violated state ethics code when he refused to be interviewed by the inspector general. Quinn responded by saying he takes full responsibility for his behavior and is focused on trying to rebuild his life. Hampton responded by thanking the IG but says she continues to be ostracized and undermined by some in the Madigan administration. Another IG report today recommended Madigan's former chief of staff, Timothy Mapes, also not be rehired by the state after presiding over a hostile workplace. Governor J.B. Pritzker wants a state senator who is under federal investigation to step down from his committee chairmanship, but the Senate president disagrees with that. 
Pritzker today called on Senator Martin Sandoval to resign from his position as chairman of the Illinois Senate's Transportation Committee. Sandoval's offices were raided by federal investigators last week, and search warrant records indicate investigators were looking for information related to Sandoval's use of public resources to get private benefits. But State Senate President John Cullerton says today it's, quote, an active investigation and that he wants to make, quote, informed decisions, end quote. As for the weather, a chance for some more showers and thunderstorms tonight, otherwise cloudy with a low around 60. And then tomorrow, patchy fog expected in the morning, but later on, cloudy with a high near 65. Now, Phil, back to you. Thank you, Paris. After weeks of speculation about when the Chicago Teachers Union might walk off the job, if they go on strike, they're now making the date official. Just moments ago, the union announced it's chosen a strike date. Brandis Friedman is live at union headquarters where it all went down. And Brandis, when could a strike happen? Well, Phil, it could happen on October 17th, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second as well. But uh, for right now, the Chicago Teachers, U Teachers Union just wrapped up a press conference with SEIU Local 73, um, where they announced that they will, that they, that the House of Delegates authorized a strike for October 17th, um, if it should come to that, if there's no contract deal for either side. Now, you'll recall that just last week, uh, Chicago Teachers Union members voted for, voted 94% in favor of a strike. Now, this means that the two unions going on strike at the same time, they'll be on the picket line at the same time if neither side reaches uh, a contract deal with the city. Now, so you know, SEIU Local 73, those members, uh, those folks are classroom assistants, bus aides, and custodians. Um, and here's, it's, it's a pretty uh, energetic room here, Phil. So here's a little bit of, uh, of what we just heard from during that press conference that both unions had a few moments ago. And we need to announce that we have set October 17th yes. as a strike deadline. Woo! achieved a fair contract settlement by that time, if we have not achieved a fair contract settlement that addresses our working conditions, our pay, and other critical issues to the students and the parents of the city of Chicago, our union will be on strike. Yeah! Now, you just heard there from Chicago Teachers Union President Jesse Sharkey uh, announcing to, like I said, a very energetic room full of members, both CTU and SEIU 73. Jesse Sharkey, CTU President, joins us right now. Jesse, uh, a lot of excited members, energetic members here tonight. Yeah, there's a lot of emotion built up in this. Um, we've been going to work in schools that have difficult conditions um, for a long time, so there's a lot of the people are concerned about short staffing, oversized classes in our buildings. Um, a lot of people in SEU 73 feel disrespected by the kind of conditions and the pay levels that they work under. Um, a lot of those folks have in common with our uh, school assistants, our school support staff, uh, low pay, and so we want to address all those conditions. Why strike at the same time and why uh, are you changing the pressure at the bargaining table by pushing the date off by a couple of weeks? I think it's powerful to have uh, more than one union unified and, and, and working in, in concert and, and talking to each other. Um, we share, the truth is that we share a similar set of concerns. Um, we want better schools. Um, we want dig dignity and respect for the people who work in those schools. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that we should we'll be able to present a very clear choice for the mayor. She can uh, make good on the promises that she made uh, when she was running, that she can put it in writing, um, or she can face a, a, a very unified um, labor movement um, that could potentially be all be, be on strike together on October 17th. Between the two of you, we're talking several thousand, tens of thousands of, of employees walking out. How many are we talking about? Um, and what what do you say to parents about the impact that that's going to have? Well, um, I think it could be as many as 35,000 workers at the same time. I mean, it, it would obviously be a difficult impact for parents. Um, you know, as a parent myself and m most of our members um, who have children have sh children in Chicago public schools, uh, y you know, obviously something we're working to avoid. Um, but what I would say to the parents is the things that we want for the schools are the things that we should all want for our children.
Um, we're fighting for a, a nurse in every school every day. Right now that doesn't happen. Um, we're fighting for low-wage workers like the people in SEIU who, um, who are like bus aides, for example. They, they had a, a person uh, up there today talking about how she was homeless for a period of time. Um, you know, the people who work with our children in our schools and the parks for that matter um, shouldn't have to like work three jobs in order to make ends meet. We think all those things make the schools better for everybody. Okay, Jesse Sharkey, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, now, Phil, we also uh, know that, for one, like one of the things that I heard earlier today when speaking with a, um, a labor and employment professor at uh, the University of Illinois, there are some pros and some cons, obviously. This, uh, this pushed back date, it does give both parties a little bit more time to come to an agreement um, with the city of Chicago. Uh, earlier tonight, one of the questions that Jesse Sharkey was asked was, if one union should receive a deal but the other one does not, uh, will that other union that got the deal go back to work and the answer was very loud and clear from the people in this room tonight it was no uh, they will not they will have some they will have solidarity um, it, this also means of course that you know when a strike does happen it will be a massive disruption for the city uh, one of the disadvantages to pushing it off and doing it in unison is that it, it adds a bit more of chaos uh, uh, and interruption uh, to the city, uh, the impact on parents and on children. Uh, and I'm sure the teachers union have to, they really have to factor in uh, w whether the community is going to be supportive of a strike that has uh, even larger uh, you know, impacts. And Phil, no word from the city just yet, no response on this potential date. Of course, we are expecting to hear some uh, some statement, some response before the night is over. Of course, uh, when we do hear that, we'll be sure to update that story on our website. For now, back to you. Brandis, thank you. And now to Carol Marine and a controversial pilot program that's proposed for public transit. Carol. Oh, thank you. Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle is supporting a proposed pilot program to lower fares and expand train service on the south side and in the southern suburbs. But Mayor Lori Lightfoot opposes the plan so far, fearing a drop in CTA ridership, which already saw a 2.5% ridership decrease last year. Now, a coalition of civic and business organizations says the pilot has the enormous potential to fix a transit desert by boosting ridership on the Metra's electric and Rock Island lines. Activists want the Metra Electric Service to match CTA fares for riders within the Chicago city limits, permit, per, I'm sorry, permit use of the Ventra card, and provide low-cost transfers to the CTA and PACE. Run trains every 10 to 15 minutes throughout the day and evening, and increase safety and security in stations. Here to talk about this three-year pilot proposal is Andrea Reed, co-chair of the Coalition for a Modern Metro Electric. She's also the executive director of the Greater Roseland Chamber of Commerce. The city, we should note, declined our invitation to join the conversation. Welcome to Chicago tonight. Thank you. In a nutshell, Ms. Reed, what's the problem that your coalition is trying to fix? Well, we are in a transit desert um, in Roseland, and um, I got on board with the coalition about four or five years ago, namely because there is a, a, a gross inequity in our community with transportation. Um, goods and, getting to goods and services is a challenge. For example, we have the Walmart and uh, the Pullman District. Um, someone that lives in the Allgill area, which driving is about maybe five to 10 minutes. Well, it takes them 45 minutes to an hour to get to the Walmart because they have to take at least three buses to get there. So that, that shouldn't be. So we want to, our proposal, when looking at the situation, is for Metra um, being a major asset in our community, an underutilized asset um, can be used to fix some of this problem. Mayor Lightfoot during the campaign supported trains every 15 minutes, as I recall, and reducing fares on the Metro Electric. Why do you think she currently is not supporting this? Well, I think the, the idea of the riders or the competition between Metro and CTA, that they're going to lose riders. 
we don't see it that way. I think that people that naturally take the, that live along the metro line will probably can, will take the metro. Currently, what's happening is because the cost of metro has increased, those people are actually using the red line. You want your coalition, and your coalition, we should point out, includes Chamber of Commerce, yes. the Civic Committee of the Commercial Club. These aren't wildly liberal organizations. These are business organizations. Exactly. Um, as I understand it, the, the coalition says the quality that your riders experience south of 95th Street uh, is lower, the commute times are higher, and the cost is higher. Right. Tony Preckwinkle, the county board president, is supporting all of this and pledging to subsidize the three-year pilot program through the county. Is the problem, therefore, uh, between Lightfoot and Preckwinkle? You know, I, I don't want to say that. I think it's just a lack of understanding. One, Metra, CTA, and PACE are the transit agencies in our, in our city. What, what we are thinking is that why are they competing? And you think, and they are competing. They're competing. And the idea is that we need to get people to where they need to go. And yet today we saw the optics of a big groundbreaking of the CTA on the north side. Yes. And, and there are other projects. There was a pledge, was there not, to extend 90, the 95th Street line, the red line, beyond Absolutely. 95th Street. What happened to that? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> so when, we, uh, when, when the chamber was originally started back in April of 2009, I was part of, and still am a part of, the red line extension committee. The um, project was to be completed in 2016. Well, it's 2019, almost 2020. And that project hasn't occurred. Therefore, you really need this Metro pilot in, the metro, in your mind because yes. that line was not completed. It's just an additional mode of transportation. So when we compare, you look north of us, you have the brown line, the purple line, the pink line, and I jokingly say a line for a line. We keep getting pointed to, well, you have the red line and it goes to 95th Street. But you know, there is life form beyond 95th Street. And these people need to have equitable transportation to get to goods and services. We, we also look at this as a quality of life issue. We, we regret that the mayor's people didn't send a spokesperson. But let me ask you, have you talked to the mayor or to her people about this? We are aggressively seeking to meet with the mayor. But you have not we yet? We haven't been able to get that appointment yet, but we are working other avenues to make that happen. And, and I think it's just a matter of understanding. We're not saying that this is the wind all. I mean, we don't have a crystal ball. We certainly don't have the money to, to guarantee that, that this will work. But the bonus in this is that um, Tony Preckwinkle uh, and the Cook County has offered to um, provide $30 million to cover any shortfall of any lost revenue for the next three years. So what, what is there to lose? And I don't know if they really understand that. Um, and that we need to clearly think about also is that the, the riders that would take the Metro are currently taking the CTA because the cost of the Metra is too expensive. And people are bypassing that, not only because of the cost of taking the Metra, but currently in some cases, the stations are just not safe. And so we've been working with Metra to get them to improve the conditions of the stations, which they have agreed to do. They've allocated $90 million to improve the stations and um, with cameras, um, with security, and just to improve aesthetically those stations. That's going to help uh, increase ridership. The other thing we need to think about is how many commuters, how many people actually drive. And those people that, if the fares were lowered, would probably take the Metro or the CTA. Well, we want you to keep us posted on Absolutely. when you do get a meeting with the mayor's office. Andrea Reed, thank you very much for joining us on Chicago Tonight. Thank you for having me. There's much more ahead. Stay with us. 
don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Still to come on Chicago Tonight, our spotlight team on the state watchdogs just released investigation into sexual harassment. A new study that claims the health risks of red and processed meat are minimal. It faces pushback from scientists. Author Naomi Klein on the need for a radical re-envisioning of society to fight climate change. Personal belongings of Vivian Meyer, plus an update on her photos joining a university collection. Jeffrey Bear on one of Chicago's most famous examples of public art in this week's Ask Jeffrey. But first, some of today's top business headlines from Cranes. Here's Ann Dwyer. Phil, the lovable losers aren't as popular as they used to be, at least if TV ratings are any guide. Two back-to-back end-of-season collapses helped drive down TV ratings for the Chicago Cubs 2019 season. The team's ratings dropped to a 4.13 local share from 4.38 in 2018, representing nearly a 6% dip year over year in Chicago viewership. That's according to AC Nielsen data obtained today by Cranes. The 2019 ratings are the lowest the team has seen since 2017. The question now is whether declining viewership and disappointing on-field performance will complicate the Cubs' efforts to launch a new and exclusive Cub-centric TV channel. Negotiations over who will carry the new cable outlet, which is expected to debut in February, remain ongoing. Meanwhile, Roosevelt University and Robert Morris University say they intend to merge, a move that could shore up the two small private schools at a time when institutions in that sector are facing intense financial pressure. If the deal does go through, Roosevelt University's name would be preserved, and the 1,800 students now enrolled at Robert Morris University would be added to Roosevelt's approximately 3,600 student roster. And finally, Chicago real estate developer Sterling Bay is picking up another property near its planned Lincoln Yards mega project. The acquisition of the old C.H. Robinson office building at 1840 North Marcy Street for an undisclosed amount means Sterling Bay is upping its bet on the future of the Chicago River's north branch between Lincoln Park and Bucktown. For Crane Chicago Business and ChicagoBusiness.com, I'm Ann Dwyer. Back to you, Phil. Thanks, Ann. A federal corruption probe grows wider still, calls for a state senator to give up his powerful chairmanship, and a state watchdog's highly anticipated report on sexual harassment is finally public. We will cover it all in this week's Spotlight Politics segment with our very own Amanda Vinicky, Parrish Schutz, and Carol Marine. Comrades, good to see you as always. Let's start with that federal probe. Uh, Amanda, what can we uh, tell us about what the uh, uh, what we know about what federal agents may have been looking for when they raided the offices of State Senator Marty Sandoval? Well, we got a copy of the subpoena that was served to the Senate offices, and we did learn things. But, Phil, if you want to take a look here, it is heavily redacted, so we definitely don't know all that we could. We know that they are looking for information about the Illinois Department of Transportation, about certain lobbyists, municipalities, Sandoval's own business, in particular a construction company, concrete business. We have reporting from WBEZ that at the same day that that some municipal offices were raided. They also raided a company that is owned by Michael Vondra. He's known as the Asphalt King, right, Carol? Well, he came up in the whole Blagojevich thing as well. But, I mean, all of this has shades kind of of Blagojevich, of, of 
questions of whether there were insider deals with the Illinois Department of Transportation, contracts, concrete, asphalt, building, roads. And Marty Sandoval is an interesting person as a state senator because he has deals with all sorts of municipalities and gets money to translate newsletters for the town of Cicero and others. There's a lot, he's got a lot of irons in the fire here, as do some of the other people. Paris, the Sun Times reports that the feds are interested in a red light camera firm with suburban connections. What can you tell us about that? Well, that, I mean, that's the Sun Times reporting. It's a, a company called Safe Speed, which, which is apparently, according to that reporting, uh, given money to a lot of public officials in these towns and has gotten contracts in many of them to put up those much maligned and detested red light cameras. I want to add on to what Amanda said about the redactions. You know, the, those redactions came from Senate President John Cullerton. Somehow the subpoena of the search warrant of State Senator Martin Sandoval had to come through the Senate President, John Cullerton, who said he's citing Illinois freedom of information law uh, by the Attorney General in what he decided to redact. So, so, so he personally or his office? His office redacted all these things. Wow. We don't really know what the rationale is, and I just saw that WBEZ is suing the Senate president now to get these unredacted to see what what exactly is being redacted here and why is, it, is, is that normal for uh, well it can it can be normal but here's the thing John Cullerton this may not be connected but is a Democrat Kwame Raul the Attorney General is a Democrat um, even though Governor Pritzker a Democrat is calling for the Senator Sandoval to resign from the Transportation Committee that oversees many of these these contracts. Um, this may be a, a more convenient and willful redaction than something at all required by the feds. The feds are heavy redactors, and apparently they're not the ones blacking it out. Because, of course, when media organizations FOIA use the tool in order to get these sort of subpoenas, for example, who could forget Alderman Ed Burke? you did not see these same sort of redactions. So while Cullerton's office does also cite having worked with the feds is another reason for all these redactions, we did not see blackouts there. Amanda, the governor spoke, uh, took questions to the media today. Uh, is It's the first time in a long time that he's spoken to reporters. <laughs> what did he have to say about this? First time in, by my count, I think five weeks, as he's been resting with a fractured femur. He has made public appearances, but the first time he's answered questions from the press, and he said that he finds corruption to be, you know, dishonorable, he wants to restore confidence in public officials. All of this certainly is going to make it difficult for him to do that, particularly, again, as he asks for graduated income tax to be implemented for voters to back that, while you have opponents saying you're writing a free blank check to uh, Democratic leaders. So this is all trouble for him. He, again, wants Sandoval to step away from that committee chairmanship, but Cullerton, again, saying no. He says he wants to make an informed decision and that this is still an active investigation. Uh, but um, presumably Marty Sandoval could step down on his own, but uh, you're saying that the President Cullerton he is what's sure giving him... He could force him out. He's oh, not, yeah. He's not but Sandoval, we haven't heard from, by the way, at all. Uh, Paris, a long-anticipated report from a state watchdog is finally public. And what did the legislative inspector general say about sexual harassment by the brother of Alderman Marty Quinn? Well, this, uh, tell us a little bit more about this that. This is, of course, into the uh, into the political operation of Mike Madigan. And Kevin Quinn was a, a political aide that had to resign after a whistleblower, Elena Hampton, had come forward. So what this IG report it did, it basically affirmed that there was sexual harassment here and that it would have recommended firing that aide, Kevin Quinn. It didn't say that he violated the state's sexual harassment statute because the statute that's currently on the books did not exist then. It was put on the books after this whole imbroglio. It does say, because of it, it does say that um, Mr. Quinn did violate the ethics ordinance by not sitting down and doing an interview with the IG. So he basically turned the IG away when the IG came to try and interview him. And it also says Tim Mapes, a former Madigan chief of staff, should not be rehired by the state either. He presided over a hostile workplace. Carol, is, uh, is the speaker implicated in any way in, in the uh, uh, regarding Tim Mapes or... Uh... Well, let's be clear. These were Madigan's bully boys. I mean, anybody who walked around the Capitol knows that. Amanda knows that we all know that they were his enforcers they had swagger and and the fact of the matter is that if Madigan didn't know then there's something wrong with his his leadership ability to not know so is he implicated I think by extension he's the boss he's the boss
Uh, Carol, let me stick with you for a second. Mayor Lightfoot campaigned as a reformer, but she has hired former alderman John Arena, who was one of her first uh, supporters. Is, uh, is she playing with her good government mantle? Well, you know, John Arena is viewed as a progressive, um, and so he's in alignment with, uh, with an awful lot of her views. But this is a time-honored tradition. You lose an election, whether you're Rahm Emanuel's people or Rich Daly's people or now Lori Lightfoot's people, We'll find a place for okay. you. Alderman Arena lost his election. Now, this job is going to pay him more than what he made as an alderman. He's going to be a top advisor to the planning commissioner. Arena lost his election because he had, he had pushed for an affordable housing project in his ward that a lot of the residents didn't want. So, you know, it's, it seems like his priorities do align with what Mayor Lightfoot wants to do with housing. But Arena was not a popular alderman among his um, Cohorts. He was he was seen as kind of difficult to get along with. So we'll we'll see if it fares any better now. I, that's where I'll have to leave it. Sorry, man. <laughs> We're out of time. <laughs> Next time I'll get you. Thank you, Amanda, Paris, and Carol. And we are back with a new study on red meat and its surprising findings. Right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part through the generous support of the Julius Franco Foundation. New research published this week says eating red meat and processed meat isn't actually that dangerous to your health, contradicting long-established guidance and prompting an outcry. An international group of researchers says the risks of heart disease, cancer, and other health problems aren't significant, but it does not call for increased red meat consumption or to label it as particularly healthy. Joining us to help explain is Bethany Dorfler. She's a registered dietitian and researcher at Northwestern's Feinberg School of uh, Medicine. Uh, Bethany Dorfler, thank you for, for joining us. Before we get into what the new study says, remind us what the existing guidelines are on red meat. The recommendations from the U.S. Dietary Guidelines are also consistent with recommendations from many other organizations, like the American Diabetes Association, the American Cancer Institute, the um, uh, World Health Organization are all very consistent with their messaging that individuals, in order to reduce their chronic disease risk, need to reduce the amount of red and processed meats they eat and in replacement of that red meat, they need to increase the amount of plants that they have in their diet. So summarize what this report says. So this report is saying that the amount of meat that individuals are eating right now is low risk enough that we may not need to be so aggressive about our guidelines or our suggestions to reduce meat even further. And your take on that? I don't want people to perceive this one paper that has come out as the suggestion that they can eat whatever they want or be lax about their lifestyle overall. And I'm afraid that people will start to see this as, you know, the people are already confused about nutrition research. And many of my clients will come to me and say, you know, first eggs are good for you, now they're bad for you. Carbs are good for you, now they're bad for you. What do we eat? So I'm afraid that this paper, unfortunately, has created a little more unrest and mistrust among individuals about what they should be eating. Do you have any concerns about the paper, about the uh, evidence on which it was based? Yes, methodologically, my colleagues and I have several things that are concerning about the paper. Uh, some things that it's really easy for people to overlook, um, considering some of the other guidelines that we're afraid that they will just simply start to, you know, to drop. One of those things is that this paper did not look at global nutrition data. It really focused on five papers. And when you look at dietary guidelines, World Health Organization guidelines, those really consider global research studies. So they're really pulling from a larger pool of nutrition studies. The other thing is that we don't have a lot of studies specifically looking at reducing red meat. So some of the studies that they were looking at 
were actually on low fat diets or eating more fruits and vegetables, and they were extrapolating the data a little to infer about red meat intake. So uh, how would you describe uh, from your perspective what the reaction to this report is in the larger medical community, people in your profession, people concerned with nutrition? I think many of us feel the same way, that this one study does not replace the decades worth of thousands of papers that we have that really consistently show that not only reducing your red meat consumption is helpful when it comes to reducing cardiovascular disease, diabetes risk, but also very specifically reducing red meat and replacing it with more plant-based proteins does something very unique in your body. It helps to reduce LDL or bad cholesterol. It helps to improve the way that your body handles insulin and blood sugar levels. So it's very important. This study did not say, and the guidelines also do not say in general, don't eat meat in, at all. It's, the guidelines are pretty clear that we want people reducing meat, we want animal proteins to be less than a third of their plate, and the other two thirds of their plate should really be made up of a variety of plants, legumes, whole grains, and fruits. So how much uh, red meat or processed meat does the average American consume? So there, on average, the suggestion has been for Americans to not exceed three to three and a half servings per week, which is about 15, 16 ounces in a week. And you have some variability there. Some Americans are eating much more than that. Um, there was- that's really not very much. I mean, if you have right. a large steak or a large hamburger, that's, right. that's it, quite a bit right there. It could arguably be one, maybe two restaurant meals of red meat in the course of the week. But when you start to consider that things like pork also count as red and processed meats, and you start to think about the way Americans eat sausage on their breakfast sandwiches or bacon on their salads, you can see that there are some Americans that are really arguably eating red and processed meats at almost every meal. So should anyone loosen or reassess their, uh, their own dietary habits as a result of this report? What I tell my clients right now is Americans eat more red and processed meats than we did 50 years ago. And there is more striking evidence than ever that including more plants, especially to box out some of those red and processed meats, offers us particular prevention when it comes to really every chronic disease. And so I tell people, don't lose your focus on reducing red and processed meats in your diet and continue to be focused on increasing more plants. You just alluded to this a minute ago, but uh, what do you tell folks who uh, see headlines about, uh, about butter is bad for you? Oh no, butter is good for you. Right. Uh, now this with uh, having to do with red meat, and there've been other stories along those same lines too. W what to make with seemingly conflicting conclusions. Yeah, it's really difficult because to really get at the issues with this particular study, you really need a nutrition research degree. Um, some of my colleagues at uh, Northwestern and I have formed this new nutrition group to work with training doctors on what messaging they should be giving their clients um, about nutrition and lifestyle recommendations in general. So I think from a grassroots perspective, we also need to make sure that our training doctors and other lifestyle professionals really have the appropriate nutrition information that they can disseminate to their patients as well. Bethany Dorfler, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you Appreciate for having it. me. And make sure to visit our website for a poll on how often you eat red meat. And up next, author Naomi Klein on why she says there's a need for a Green New Deal. Over the past year, a term new to many Americans has entered the political lexicon, the Green New Deal. Inspired by President Franklin Roosevelt's Depression-era programs, the plan proposes a wide-ranging and what some might call radical new vision of society in order to fight climate change. One early advocate of a Green New Deal was author Naomi Klein. Now her ideas are outlined in a new book called On Fire, 
the burning case for a Green New Deal. And Naomi Klein joins us now. Welcome back to Chicago Tonight. So this is a term that's been, uh, that's been used quite a bit recently, alluded to, uh, and, and yet it seems to have different iterations or different shadings. How do you describe it? Well, the way I describe it is it's an approach to the climate crisis that recognizes that we live in a time of multiple and overlapping crises. So yes, we have an urgent ecological crisis and scientists have told us that we have just a little bit more than a decade to cut global greenhouse gas emissions in half. Um, but we also have an inequality crisis. We also have a crisis of racial injustice. We also have a crisis of precarious work and underemployment. So the Green New Deal is about multitasking. It's about saying, okay, if we need to transform our infrastructure in the face of the climate crisis, why wouldn't we try to build a fair economy on multiple fronts at the same time? Why wouldn't we wage a war on poverty and racial exclusion at the same time? So that's what a Green New Deal is. We, by lowering our emissions, we can create millions of great jobs. We can close these entrenched gaps. Uh, now, uh, some folks might say, well, why do you mix all that together if yeah. your concern, if your primary concern, or if a mm. primary concern is climate change, why sort of complicate things by uh, putting these other issues into this new green, uh, new green deal, green new deal version yeah. that you're describing? So I actually don't think it complicates it or makes it harder. I actually think that it makes the vision more popular and a lot of the polling shows that. And if you look at what happens when governments try to approach the climate crisis through a narrow kind of market-based mechanism like a carbon tax or cap and trade, it often gets immediately associated with your costs going up, your electricity costs going up, your, the price of the pump going up. Um, and at a time when we have so much inequality, that often leads to backlash. And a recent example of this is what has happened in France under Emmanuel Macron, where he, um, you know, as president, he, uh, he has cut taxes for the wealthy, he has attacked trade unions, but he also sees himself as a climate champion and he introduced a carbon tax which increased the, 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 the price of gas. And lo and behold, you have this uprising which is the yellow vest movement. And I think probably some of your viewers remember these scenes of you know, rioting across France. And that ultimately led to Macron having to roll back the carbon tax. So you end up with the worst of all worlds really. Because, so that seemed practical and it seemed very focused. But the whole point of a Green New Deal is recognizing that we do live in a time of, of economic stress. And you really can't ask people to choose between, you know, in France, uh, the, the slogan of that uprising was, you care about the end of the world, we care about the end of the month. And the Green New Deal is saying, you know what? We all have a right to care about both. No one should have to choose. And let's figure out a way to deal with the climate crisis, which actually eases some of the economic stresses that, that working people have. Because some of the pushback against the concept of a, of a Green New Deal is the whole notion that it's incompatible with uh, many aspects of this country's economic system, capitalism, is it? Well, it is a transformation, and, and you know, exactly a year ago, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, which is a UN body that it, that is a, a, a gathering of scientists who are tasked with advising governments on, you know, what the what what the latest climate scientist tells them about how how quickly we need to lower our emissions. They put out a report. And they said that we did need to have our global emissions. And they said what, what is required to do this is fundamental transformation of every aspect of society. I mean, they didn't mince any words. This was in the summary of the report of the IPCC. And so it does require transformation. And I think the point of calling it a Green New Deal um, is to hearken back to the original New Deal and a time when this country did embrace transformative change really changed the mix of its economy uh, in the face of a great crisis. In, in the case of, of the original New Deal, it was, of course, the Great Depression, but also the Dust Bowl. You had a twin ecological and, and economic crisis, and it wasn't a single policy. It was Social Security, unemployment insurance, breaking up the banks, the Civilian Conservation Corps, which planted more than two billion trees, all kinds of programs that provided direct relief to families, also a renaissance of funding for the arts. That was the New Deal and much, much, much more. 
the problem with the original New Deal is that many people were excluded. African American workers were excluded. Domestic workers were excluded. Agricultural workers were excluded. And so this can't just be about painting the original New Deal green. Um, we also need to close the gaps that were opened up in that era, or at least entrenched in that era. And, uh, and yet, and notwithstanding the fact that uh, some of those groups were, ex uh, groups were excluded, as you just mentioned, there was still a sense of urgency because people's, the impact of the Depression was pretty clear for people to see. Absolutely. What do you say to folks who still don't sense that climate change is a real issue for them? Well, first of all, we are seeing a huge shift in the polling um, just in this past year, where it used to be that you had this pretty um, clear divide between Republican voters and Democratic voters about whether or not there was even a recognition that climate change was real and that humans were causing it. Now a clear majority of Americans recognize that climate change is real and that, um, that humans are the cause, but much more significant than that shift is a shift in the urgency that Americans feel about climate change. It used to be that even among Democrats who said, yes, I care about climate change, yes, I know that humans are causing it, if you asked them to rank, you know, various issues in order of importance, climate change would come in like 19th or 20th. In the latest polling, climate change is rivaling health care as a top priority for Democratic voters going into the primaries. And it's simply because a great many Americans now have firsthand experience either with record breaking storms if they live on the coasts, or flooding if they live in the center of the country, or wildfires if they live in the west. Um, and so this is not a far off threat for a great many Americans, and this is reflected in the polling. And I think you see it in the fact that many of the contenders to lead the Democratic Party have embraced the Green New Deal because they, they see this is where the votes are. Uh, the Green New Deal has been embraced by a couple of candidates, uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren. But uh, w beyond that, I mean, given the current political climate, do you see that there is the potential for the political implementation that would be required for this to be embraced? There's no doubt that it's a heavy lift. Um, there's no doubt that that you would need to take back the Senate. You would need to hold on to that, that majority in the House. Um, you'd need to use executive power. But if we look at what FDR did, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting to look at is how he rolled out the most popular program of, uh, under the original New Deal, which was the Civilian Conservation Corps, which are these hundreds of, uh, of camps that were spread out all over rural, rural America to deal with deforestation and soil erosion. So you had thousands, we actually had more than two million American young men who were sent from mostly from cities to go into these camps and to plant trees and to deal with soil erosion. And if you look at where FDR cited these camps, he seemed to cite them pretty systematically in the parts of the country that didn't vote for him. Mm. Um, and lo and behold, in 1936, many of those areas flipped blue because people saw the benefits of it. So I think there are some things that are gonna have to be done you know, by, through executive power, but when people experience the benefits, the job creation, the, the increased services, uh, the improved services, then it actually tends to, to, to um, be, it, it tends to break through some of that partisan divides, that you, those partisan divides that are pretty tough to break through in Washington. Naomi Klein, thank you so much for joining us. Very much appreciate it. Thank you. Again, the book is called On Fire, The Burning Case for a Green New Deal. The legend of street photography Vivian Meyer has grown immeasurably since her death in April of 2009. Not long before she died, more than 100,000 photographs and negatives of hers were rediscovered when they were purchased at auction from a Chicago storage facility. Recently, the collector who acquired the majority of her work made a gift to the University of Chicago. 2,700 black and white and color images and some artifacts. We recently brought you this story. Here is Jay Shevsky with another look. At the Regenstein Library, the Special Collections Department holds an assortment of still cameras, movie cameras, and personal items from the part-time photographer and full-time North Shore nanny, Vivian Meyer. 
a library team is processing works new to its collection, including pictures of Meyer's world travels and some very specific Chicago images that offer a glimpse of a changing city. But mostly there are people. She had a kind of intimacy or an intimate relationship with the world and with those that she was photographing. I think there's a sense of empathy with the common everyday person as opposed to paparazzi or purely the down and out. So I think she's exploring what is her subject. Even when she was traveling, you can see her trying to figure out who it is that she's interested in. The famously private Vivian Meyer was profiled on WTTW in 2010 when I delved into the discovery of collector John Maloof. And her story was explored in the Oscar-nominated documentary, Finding Vivian Meyer. No one knows exactly what her motives were, but looking at the work, it certainly does tell a story about a woman working through the 40s, 50s, 60s, and how she saw the world and how she moved through the world. One also gets a similar sense of what was Chicago, what it meant to be you know, a woman, I think even today, walking down the street, how, how one is looked at, how one has certain permission to be able to stare, to be able to make photographs. Um, and that's changed over time with you know, smartphone technology. But she records an era that would otherwise not be visible to us. The university is keeping a tight lid on the material while they process the gift. Then the photos, contact sheets, and ephemera will be made available to students and researchers. It's rare to be able to see this kind of, sort of underneath the, the covers, I guess, if you will, of how an artist is thinking. The story of the undiscovered artist is always a kind of thrill. Finding this massive set of images by this artist who was relatively unknown is really exciting because one wonders what anyone has, the potential of you know, anyone's creativity. It really does give us a chance to delve into what she was thinking about and to try and understand what it was she was aspiring to see. In other words, the story about the world, not only about her. For Chicago Tonight, this is Jay Shevsky. It is collector John Maloof's second gift to the University of Chicago. In 2017, he donated 500 prints to the library. And WTTW found out today that the processing of the new collection was just completed. Anyone interested in studying it can contact the university's Regenstein Library, and you can see more of Vivian Meyer's work on our website as well. From the Picasso statue to the bean to the city's countless murals, public art is a vibrant part of Chicago's cultural landscape. But for over a century, Chicagoans have taken a special pride in a pair of sculptures watching over Michigan Avenue. Here to tell us more is Jeffrey Bear in this week's edition of Ask Jeffrey. Hey, Jeffrey, this is, uh, you know what, this is always a good one to go to because we've all seen them. And the question is, what is the history of the lions outside of the Yes, Yes, the lions, they are like like old familiar friends, aren't they? Oh, we've, yeah. As you've said, we've passed them all. We've all passed them a hundred times and yet we don't really know the story behind them. So here we go. Um, like so many things in Chicago, the history of the Lions can be traced back to the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition, the Great World's Fair. So uh, what you might not know is that the original section of the Art Institute building itself which the Lions Guard was also built for the World's Fair. It was the only structure outside of Jackson Park and uh, one of just a few that weren't demolished shortly after the fair ended. Um, the building opened in 1893, but for almost a year, take a look, Phil, its front doors were unguarded. Isn't that funny? No lions in that picture. It's like a mustache is missing. <laughs> yeah. the, the lions weren't installed until May 1894. They were designed by sculptor who was then a, a Chicagoan, Edward Kemmies. And how did Kemmies land such a big commission? Well, Kemmies was, uh, in the 1800s, he was considered the country's premier Animalier, look at that bohemian-looking fellow there. He With was a an, an animalier, <laughs> a fancy French word for sculptor of animals. Um, like many American artists of the time, Kemi's was drawn to scenes of, of raw, unfiltered nature. So you can see that in some of his smaller pieces that we're going to show here. Um, the Art Institute actually hosted an exhibition of his work in 1885, um, which was at their previous location. So this is before the fair. It was a few blocks south on, uh, at Michigan and Van Buren. 
Chemies ended up creating a dozen sculptures for the World's Fair in 1893, more than any American. Um, and like much of the exposition's uh, white city, they were actually made of plaster and they were not meant to last. And that included the two lions. It also included two other sculptures that Chicagoans may recognize. These two bison, which stand in Humboldt Park, just north of Division Street. So how did temporary plaster lions that he created become permanent uh, bronze ones? Well, so after the fair closed, um, an early benefactor of the Art Institute, whose name was Florence Lathrop Page, commissioned bronze casts of these um, uh, designs. Uh, Page, by the way, was a sister-in-law of Marshall Fields, mm. very much in Chicago society. Um, and since then, of course, these lions have become icons. In fact, we even have one, there it is, right on our shelf here on the Chicago Tonight set. Um, each lion, not this little guy here, but each of the real lions, uh, weighs uh, over two tons. And if you look closely, uh, you'll realize they are not identical twins, which is another thing people maybe just walk right by. Um, Kemis wanted them to have their own personality and style. He titled the Northern Lion on the Prowl, with its mouth slightly open there, gazing into the distance. Contrast that with the courage or maybe the hubris of the Southern Lion, which is shown in, quote, an attitude of defiance. You can see that coming through in his body language. Notice the upturned, regal head. You wouldn't want to mess with either of these lions. I don't think so. You know, I see a lot of people reading books uh, on the steps because they like to read between the lions. Yes. Anyway, <laughs> over the years, the lions have become uh, more than just statues. They're almost the city's mascots, oh, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 you know, that sort of regal stoicism, stoic realism that uh, Kemi's was going for in his designs has been greeted with a certain amount of playfulness. Going back decades, you can see that in, in uh, the way they're shown on the, the cover of the Chicagoan magazine in 1928. More recently, of course, the Lions have become diehard Chicago sports fans. Whenever a local team has a strong postseason, they don Blackhawks or Bears helmets or Cubs or Sox hats, alas, maybe next year. Um, anyway, there's also the ceremonial wreathing of the lions every year, accompanied by a holiday-themed performance. And I didn't know this. Today, the lions actually have their own Twitter account. They post semi-regularly, mostly about local sports and other bits of local culture, such as um, talking about the only proper way to make a Chicago hot dog, which, you know, a wild carnivore probably should know. <laughs> well, I'm glad the lions are staying current, uh, keeping up with the times. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeffrey. So are you. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs> and you can find more on Chicago's beloved Art Institute Lions on our website. And while you're there, make sure to submit your question to Jeffrey Bear. And we're back to wrap things up right after this. Ask Jeffrey on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Benny's Beverage Depot. In 1948, Benny's Beverage Depot opened its first store down the street from Wrigley Field. And for over 70 years, Benny's mission has remained the same, helping you celebrate the best times of your life. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7 with House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff in town, the latest on impeachment. And after a multi-million dollar makeover in time for its centennial, we explore some of the ancient artifacts at the Oriental Institute Museum. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce and I thank you for watching. Good night.
Closed captioning for this program is brought to you by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, dedicated to preserving the dignity and rights of all individuals.